Welcome to the eLaborate Topics Podcast, where we focus on lab-specific strategies for medical laboratory professionals. We're proud to be the healthcare detectives that work behind the scenes to get the results needed to influence medical decisions. Let's grow together and jump right into the lab. Welcome to Elaborate Topics, your weekly podcast that brings to you topics on all things medical laboratory. I am your host, Lona Small. I'm a clinical lab scientist, a quality assurance specialist, and a lab leadership trainer and coach. And today I'm excited to talk to you about designing your ideal team. When I talk to lab leaders about challenges they're having, many times I get challenges around people problems and hardly any challenges around process issues. So I get complaints about things like unreliable team members, like team members not coming to work, things like unsupported team members, people are not team players or are not supported to leadership, or just um, team members with recurring errors and among other things. But as I said, mostly about people. And years ago, as a core lab supervisor, I would be clueless on, on how to address some of those people issues. But with time, I gained experience as a process and lean leader as a project manager and now as a leadership coach and trainer, I've gained so much experience to deal with people problems. And the funny thing about it, a lot of these people issues, I actually use process solutions. And I get really amazing results. And, And so I want to share some of that with you, and if you notice, I do some of these trainings on this podcast. I know it's easy to want that quick fix as a leader because it's busy and there's just always so many moving parts, and so we want to just address things and move on. So we're trying to avoid the overwhelm that's already there. So let's fix it and move on. So I'm going to give you this scenario. I'm a supervisor, and Susie falls out of line. So I call her to my office, and I do the disciplinary action. But I make sure that I document, document, because it's so important for that paper trail. And (laughs) yes, that paper trail. And I also, in the back of my mind, hoping that Susie will tell her friend Beth so that Beth will hear this and just don't try the whatever Susie tried. So that will kind of help. But then there's James who's messing up tomorrow. And so the next day, there are two call-outs. And I want to address this and nip this in the bud, but there are two call-outs and I have to be on the bench. Make a note that I'll address this with James. And The important thing is like, okay, we want to set that precedent so that others don't follow. But it seems as if it never ends. You know, I'm trying to nip it in the bud, and it seems like a guacamole. You know, I'm trying to catch it as it raises its dirty head, but, you know, I'm missing it. I'm busy, and, you know, I'm really trying hard. So then, you know, I'm saying how and when does this end? So the quick fix that we think about, it appears quick, but it's more focused on the symptoms, and the problems really don't go away. So we're actually left overwhelmed and stressed. What we're trying to avoid, like let's just do it quick to avoid the overwhelm, it's actually creating that overwhelm and that stress. And Of course, there are so many times you want to tear your hair out. You want to quit. I've heard, I've spoken to lab leaders who, like, you know, I really love what I do. I want to make a difference. 
but I have to think of me. And I've seen lab leaders just decide to just step down because of self-care. So here's the process solution that I teach the lab leaders that I coach. And as I say, I get amazing results. So think about your current situation of stress and overwhelm and just make a commitment to do something different. Even though it may seem that it may need to take a little extra time up front, but the results will be more lasting, a more lasting change. So I'm going to list those, these process steps that I use. The first one is to create a vision of how you want your team to be. The second one is to assess the current situation. And you can write these down. I usually ask my listeners to write it down because it's going to be important if you want to apply it. So first thing is to create a vision of how you want your team to be. Second thing is to assess the current situation with your team and identify the gaps. The third thing would be to plan some adjustments to fill the gaps and build the, on your current team. And then the fourth thing would be to reassess again to see if there are any additional needs. And the fifth thing would be to hire to complement or fill any remaining gaps. And the sixth thing would be reinforce the culture through the same methods that you use to build your team. So these are the six steps, but don't worry, I'm going to go through them again because we are going to actually discuss them. So create a vision of how you want your team to be. So you're going to spend some time before you start your shift or on a weekend and just reflect on the team, your dream team, the team that you dream of having. So you're going to look at different aspects of your team. You're going to look at the skills that you want. Uh, would, based on your lab, are you looking for more generalists or are you looking for specialists or are you looking for a combination? And if you are, what percentage of each would you be looking for? Um, competency, how well do you want to see your team performing? You know what you'd actually like to accomplish. So. In terms of competency, how would you want them to be performing their duties? Diversity, this is a big discussion um, recently. But when I'm thinking of diversity, I'm thinking of diversity when it comes to different areas, a broad, pers um, broad scope. Diversity in skills that we mentioned before. Diversity in education. Um, depending on the size of your lab, you could be looking at from lab tech, go up to maybe a master's degree in CLS, or even a doctorate in clinical lab scientists, um, depending on what you want to accomplish. But that diversity is going to be very helpful. Diversity in experience. So you could have, you don't want to have all entry level staff or, or new staff or not too many of the seasoned staff and not enough entry-level staff. And it's so important when it comes to actually accomplishing different duties or different perspectives. And talking about perspective, you look at diversity when it comes to socioeconomic because with socioeconomic people coming from different perspectives, it's going to be very helpful when it comes to connecting with different people, connecting with different situations, making decisions on different situations with those different perspectives in mind when it comes to patients. Diversity with ethnicity, that's been a big topic. And gender, that's going to be so important with perspective, as we say. Having that different exposure, having those different experiences is going to be very helpful in that workplace. So think about how you envision your team diversity. What about values? What values are you hoping for your team? 
when you think about values, I'm thinking, what do you want your team to care about? In order to accomplish your vision, what are some of the things you want them to care about? Just examples would be things like teamwork or collaboration, thinking about respect for others, um, patient-centeredness. These are just examples. But it's going to depend on the vision that you have for your team would be the kind of values that you would envision your team to have. Another thing would be the total FTEs that you need to operate for some efficient workflow. So you're creating that vision of the team that you'd want to see in different aspects, and you're writing that down. That's number one. Number two would be assessing the current situation with your team and identifying the gaps that you have. So what is the actual state of your current team compared to the vision that you have for your team? So with that, that's where you're going to identify the gap. You'll identify the skills gap, the diversity gap, the values gap, the competency gap, the numbers gap. So you're going to document those gaps that you, when you look at your current team and where they are and where you want them to be. Identify these gaps. Number three, you, now you're planning adjustments to fill the gaps and build your current team. So you're deciding what needs to be done to build your team, the team that you envision. So some of these adjustments that you're going to have to make can actually take place immediately. And others, you would probably have to set a timeline for those to happen. So things like training to fill that competency and skills gap, think about how you're going to um, make that happen and decide when. You could be thinking of cross-training. So what are some of the things that you're going to have to do in terms of adjustment? You want to identify individuals who are not meeting some of those behaviors or skills, goals, and set performance improvement plans for those people. You kind of want to clarify the team value. So you have that um, vision, and you know what the gaps are, but now you're going to act on those um, values. So you want to actually set some shared values. So in order to do that, you could just have regular conversations with your team, just like daily talk, or you could do rounding and talk about values in rounding. What, just find out what are the things that mean a lot to your team. You know, what do they care about? You could even set up intentional meetings to just talk about these things. And while you're doing it, you're identifying values that are shared among your team members and values that are shared uh, among just you and the vision that you have for them. And that's kind of how you establish shared values for your team. And while you're at it, it's going to be important to communicate the vision that you have for your team. You're communicating that vision through just all your daily activities. You want to build it into your into activities and just make sure that you know you're communicating about it, you're um, making it part of some of the things that they do. You want them to know the vision that you have and Make sure that you're creating that as part of the culture. So talk about it as much as you can. Include it in activities as much as you can when it comes to training, when it comes to skill set, when it comes to um, your, the values, just all of those different visions. You're going to talk about that as much as possible and build that into your team. So you want to look for opportunities to challenge your team to accomplish these um, goals or these visions, and you want to let them know that you believe in them, and you want to let them know that you believe that they can do it. So encouraging and challenging is so important and motivating. So whenever people reach 
small little milestones, you want to celebrate those small wins. And that's kind of ways to reinforce the new culture in your team. And another thing is to coach and empower. So you spend a lot of time with your training and you're making sure that people are competent. If you've done that, you need to kind of empower them to do what they're trained to do. Coach them and let them go. So kind of step back on micromanaging. It's still important to monitor, but allow the team to have some autonomy. Allow them to have decision-making and flexibility so that they can feel comfortable and confident in the things that they do. And what that does when you're allowing those kind of autonomy, it's freeing you up to make more decisions and freeing you up to grow your team even more and reducing the stress that you have. So it's so important to empower your team. And one really, really important thing is to be that role model. So you talk about your vision with your team, you understand their shared values, your training, and you're building up your team, you're challenging your team, but you, it's going to be important for you to walk that talk. And so you don't want to confuse your team when you're saying one thing and doing the other. So it's going to be important for you to be that ideal role model for your team, not, not saying that we don't all mess up, but try to be as consistent as possible, especially if it's something that you really personally want and believe in. You really believe in that vision and you have those value system for yourself, so be that role model. One of the last things that's going to be the most difficult one, maybe for some people, would be to actually dismiss underperformance. And you did all you needed to do when it comes to setting up your performance improvement goals, working with um, low and underperformers to meet those goals when it comes to behaviors and skills goals. It comes to a time where you have to separate certain behavioral issues from your team. And that may be hard, but once your team and everybody, they're on board and they know where you're trying to go, they're clear about the vision and the value of your team, it's going to be more understanding because you're more transparent and it's something that you're all working towards and you've done everything that you needed to do, so you would have to separate from underperformance. So we're at number three where you have a clear vision. You look at your current state and you look at the gaps and you are actually making adjustments to fill those gaps and to build your team to where you want your team to be. So because you have made a lot of adjustments, it's going to be important to reassess. So number four is reassess to see if there are any additional needs. So you look back and you're like, okay, we've made all these adjustments. We have actually ended up separating from some um, team members, and we have grown a lot of team members. So sometimes you may not even need as many people as you think you need, depending on how, you know, if you have worked on cross-training and growing people to make decisions and moving them into probably um, leadership roles, depending. But you want to reassess to see your needs. And once you do that, and you're going to hire, you want to hire to complement or fill any gaps remaining after all the adjustment and work that you have done. So after all your training, cross-training, performance improvement, you're going to hire to complement, not to mirror, but to complement. So you spend some time to build your team. You know the culture, and you have established shared value and shared vision. So now you're in a good place to hire with clarity. You know whom you want to complement your team with. So you're basically going to be hiring based on the same vision that you set for your team. You, as I said, you're going to complement 
the skills, their complement values, diversity, and experience of your team because you're clear about that. And then once you hire, you're going to allow time for training and to make that effort to assimilate the new team member into that new team culture. So that's the hiring. And then the last thing you're going to do is to try to reinforce that culture through those same methods used to build your team. Yes, you have new team members, so you're going to go back to reinforce among everyone to continue to communicate their vision, continue to challenge, to empower, to coach, and to role model. And this could be seen almost as a cycle because you want to make this a continuous effort to reinforce, a continuous e effort to assess and um, reassess, but you're making sure that you're following it in a process step. You're following one, two, three in a process step and making sure that you're reinforcing that culture that you want to see. So it is tempting to try to say, for instance, I'll hire to complement my team, but then you didn't work up front to build your team. It's kind of that a la carte thing where you think, let me pull this one out. I just um, hire to complement my team. But what happens is that you end up just adding maybe a problem person because you haven't developed clarity about your team culture or the values that you want for your team or even understanding the value that you want in that new hire. So you could be creating more problems by just hiring without building your team. Another Alec Carte uh, problem could be just trying to adjust your current team in terms of training or establishing shared values without having that clear vision of where you want your team to be. So you will not know what adjustments you need to make if you don't have a clear vision of where you want your team to be. So don't start with training and adjustments and all of that without having that clear vision. So it's very important to spend time and use the process step in that order. So the first thing that I would do if I were you when I'm done with this podcast is to go back to my notes and identify the first step. And I would take that first step, get to a quiet place, and write down the vision that I'd want to see in my team. So for you, I'm going to say take that time Get to a place where you're not being disturbed and just write down the vision that you'd want for your team. Just go through the skills that you'd want, the, the competency, the diversity. Um, just go through all of that in terms of the number of people that you'd want, the value that you'd want to see in your team, and write that down as a vision. And once you write that down, then go from there in terms of your process step. So I really enjoyed sharing these with you. I really enjoy that I tend to share some of the, the things that either I share on maybe my public YouTube channel. Sometimes it's just new ideas that I want to construct with you, but sometimes I share things that I share with my coaching clients because I know that would be beneficial to you. So because of this, I'm going to ask that if you have results or any stories or progress with this, I'd really want to hear from you. So you can reach out directly to me at lonasmall at lonasmall.com. If you have any questions regarding this or if you just want to contact me regarding just leadership coaching, so you can email me directly or you can just reach out to me on LinkedIn, 
under Lona Gordon Small. So, um, as I said, it was really a pleasure to share this with you. And thank you for tuning in and checking out this episode of Elaborate Topics with me, your host, Lona Small. If you like what you heard today and you want to listen to previous shows, subscribe at directimpactbroadcasting.com or your favorite podcast platform. And just remember to send us an email at elaboratetopics at directimpactbroadcasting.com to learn more about topics, this topic and any other topic um, from other guests. And also, if you want to be a guest on the show, you can let us know. So just tune in next week to hear from another amazing episode with elaborate topics. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Elaborate Topics where your hosts discussed relevant strategies for laboratory professionals. Please subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and listen to us on directimpactbroadcasting.com. Stay tuned for another episode with information you can use to excel in your laboratory career.